welcome uh, everyone to um, today's uh, webinar on um, the IA's Global Hydrogen Review uh, 2023 edition. My name is Timo Gül. I'm the Chief Energy Technology Officer of um, the International Energy Agency, and I'm truly delighted to welcome you all to uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, which is in fact the second webinar of the day um, on our Global Hydrogen uh, Review. I'm joined here by the authors of uh, this report who will be presenting to you just in a moment the key findings of this year's edition of the Global Hydrogen Review. Before we do that, um, allow me to give you some uh, context that um, might be useful um, for, for the rest of the webinar. Uh, hydrogen, and I'm sure this is all why you are also joining here today, is enjoying a lot of attention, uh, public attention today. Um, but as for many, many other clean energy technologies, um, from solar PV to um, uh, battery, uh, electric cars, batteries, etc., um, the roots of um, hydrogen go um, back decades for RD&D and um, for policy. The IA has actually been working on hydrogen topics for a very, very long time. In fact, in 1977, just three years after the IA was founded, um, uh, the member governments established the so-called hydrogen, or to, what is to, today called Hydrogen Technology Collaboration Program to foster international rd and on hydrogen. Um, we here as the IA Secretariat, we have significantly stepped up our um, efforts over the last couple of years, particularly since the release of our landmark report, The Future of Hydrogen, which was published in 2019, uh, at the request of the Japanese G20 presidency. And then in 2021, just two years ago, we released for the very first time um, a new annual, annual report to inform policymakers and industry about the developments in the hydrogen sector. That's the Global Hydrogen Review that uh, we are discussing here uh, today. It is, in fact, our main publication when it comes to tracking projects, uh, pr tracking pro progress in uh, hydrogen production and use worldwide, as well as progress in critical areas such as infrastructure development, trade, policy, regulation, investment, and of course, uh, innovation. The report, uh, just for the record, here is an output of the Clean Energy Ministerial Hydrogen Initiative, which is supported by more than 20 uh, governments and to which the IEA is the coordinator. Um, the uh, report benefits enormously from its membership um, of this uh, Clean Energy Ministerial um, Hydrogen Initiative. And so we are immensely grateful for the support we are receiving by the members. Now, before the colleagues present to you uh, in detail the findings of this year's edition, let me highlight three main insights that I find particularly important from this year's edition. The first one uh, is the very impressive pipeline of announced projects for um, the production of low emission hydrogen. Uh, it is increasing it's increasing very, very quickly, particularly in the case of electrolysis projects that have inc uh, increased in number, in size, and in terms of geographical diversity. There are plans to build electrolyzers in more than 100 countries around the world today. If all these announced projects were realized, then low emission hydrogen production could reach 38 million tons by the year 2030 from electrolyzers, but also from fossil fuels with CCS combined, up from practically nothing uh, today. Whether or not these projects will go ahead, and this is my second key insight from this year's edition of the Global Hydrogen Review, is of course very, very uncertain. Only 4% of uh, the announced production capacity has reached the stage of taking a final investment decision and cost pressures, particularly the cost of finance, are making it more and more difficult to realize these projects, putting at risk the achievement of government goals in this uh, sector. The third key insight that I wanted to highlight is um, the fact that we, of course, um, note and are very impressed by the huge scale of ambition to produce low emission hydrogen, in particular from electrolysis. But it's also, in a, what our report also shows, is that there is quite limited action uh, taken to create the demand for this uh, low emission hydrogen. Action to create demand, be it in existing applications, like in uh, refining or um, the chemical industry, or in new applications, uh, such as steel or in other areas, is currently lagging behind ambitions to produce low emission hydrogen. Now, the hydrogen sector is extremely dynamic. Um, to track progress 
we are not only um, producing our report, the Global Hydrogen Review, but we are maintaining at the IA a database of all low emission hydrogen production projects around the world. Um, we started this effort back in 2019 with the release of our landmark report, The Future of Hydrogen. Um, at the time, there was just a very modest number of projects that um, we could be tracking. Today, we released an updated version of this um, database uh, on our website, and it comprises now almost 2,000 individual projects worldwide. Given the importance of uh, infrastructure for the scale-up of hydrogen, we are also releasing for the very first time a database on infrastructure projects, including hydrogen pipelines, storage facilities, as well as import and export terminals. In addition to the two databases, we will also present on our website in about two weeks, if everything goes well, uh, two new interactive tools. One tool to explore the database of low emission hydrogen production projects. The other one to visualize global hydrogen production costs for renewable hydrogen in particular. So in order to allow you as users of our website to explore the sensitivity of key parameters on production costs for um, renewable hydrogen. Um, before I pass on the word um, to my colleagues, just a practical note here. After the presentation of the report, there will be a Q&A session. Please use the um, question function in Zoom to post your questions so that we can address them as they come in uh, later in the Q&A. The slides of the presentation will, of course, also be made available on our website. Um, so um, you don't have to note down every single thing that is um, um, on the slide. You will have them available on our website. With that, I hand over the word to my colleague, uh, Dr. Uwe Remme, who is uh, the head of um, the um, Hydrogen and Alternative Fuels Unit and one of the authors of this report. Over to you, Uwe. Thank you very much, Timur, and um, also welcome from my side. Um, so let me start um, by providing also some context. So if we're looking at um, uh, low emission hydrogen political um, momentum um, is um, has remained um, strong, driven by um, the or boosted by climate ambition, also aims to enhance energy security and more lately also industrial strategies to um, by major economies, including also hydrogen technologies, which can play an important part in these industrial strategies. Um, but if still this momentum is not turning into deployment. And if you look at the production side, um, hydrogen is still being produced uh, almost completely by unabated fossil fuels. Um, this, of course, can change if low emission hydrogen overcomes the cost bar barrier that it's currently facing. Actually, um, a huge number of of low emission hydrogen production projects is currently under development. And if all of these announced projects are being realized, actually global hydrogen production by 2030 could reach 38 million tons. Um, governments have also started um, to provide funding to first large scale projects. Um, however, um, the lengthy time lag between the announcement of these programs and the moment in time when these um, funding becomes available for product developers is actually delaying investment decisions. And um, the third point I would like to mention is that the cost um, challenge that we still see for low emission hydrogen has been exacerbated uh, by inflation, meaning we've seen, um, particularly in the last year, increases in costs um, of equipment like electrolyzers, but also increases in the cost of financing. The situation is actually more varying if you look at um, the demand side and um, government action so far has very much focused um, on the production side and measures to stimulate demand for low emission hydrogen has actually just very recently attracted policy attention. So this has led to a gap in ambition between um, the demand and the supply side. Um, on the private sector side, we see that um, companies have started to sign uh, first offtake agreements but um, efforts remain still at a very small scale, and these agreements are often also non-binding non -binding and preliminary. And the third point I would like to mention is that um, we see that um, governments and other private sector have started to establish um, inter international cooperation initiatives for low emission technologies, including also the aim to aggregate demand for hydrogen, 
but the demand signals we're seeing from the initiatives is um, at the moment still unclear. So overall, one can um, say that um, the adoption of low emission hydrogen as a clean industry feedstock and also as a clean en energy vector is still at a very early stage. And in this year's um, Global Hydrogen Review, we try to identify what are the key, prior key priorities on which governments and the private sector should focus on to turn the momentum into deployment and also to allow hydrogen to play the role um, in the clean energy transition in the future. So with that, I hand over to my colleague, um, Stravola. Thank you. Let's start with some uh, positive news which come from the deployment of the electrolyzer. Uh, the installed electrolyzer capacity has been growing the last few years, but starting from a very low base. In 2022, the global installed electrolyzer's capacity reached almost a level of 700 megawatts, which is a 20% increase compared to the previous year. The year 2023 shows a continuation of this growth with a huge jump on the developments. Based on the, based on the projects that have at least reached a final investment decision or they are under construction, the global installed electrolyzer's capacity could uh, more than triple comparing to the year of 2022, reaching the level of two gigawatt by the end of 2023. Actually, more than 400 megawatts have already entered into operation since the beginning of this year. The leader on the electrolyzer's developments is China. In 2020, the country accounted for less than 10% of the global installed capacity, and this number is accepted, expected to reach the level of 1.2 gigawatts by the end of 2023, which is half of the global uh, electrolyzer's capacity. The outlook for 2030, according to the announced projects, looks much more impressive. Based on the announcements, the global installed electrolyzer's capacity could reach the level of 420 gigawatts by 2030, which is an increase of 75% compared to the announcements that they were reported in the Global Hydrogen Review of 2022. Regarding the size of the projects, we observe that there is a trend on the development of larger, larger electrolyzer projects. Today, there are only two facilities in the world uh, with, uh, with installed capacities over 100 megawatt. However, in 2030, the gigawatt scale represents more than 75% of the announced capacity. We should not forget that uh, there are still a lot of obstacles and problems that we have to overcome. When we are looking at the maturity of the projects, we can see that uh, we are still far from realizing the full potential of the project pipeline. Today, electrolysis projects that have at least taken a final investment decision account for only 3% of the total capacity of the announced projects. In addition, more than half of the total capacity is still at the very early stages of development. The, ge ge the geographical diversity increases in parallel with the growth of uh, the electrolyzer's de de development. Overall, a total capacity of around 14 gigawatts is already committed, which means that these projects are in operation, under construction, or they have at, re at least reached the final investment decision. China and Europe are the leaders on these developments. China has committed today 14 projects uh, with the size of above 100 megawatts, which could be operative by the end of next year of 2024. Europe has a much larger number of projects committed, but with considerably smaller sizes. Of course, there are some exceptions like the Swedish projects called hybrid and H2 green steel projects, and the Holland hydrogen projects, um, which is based in Netherlands. In the Middle East, we are observing a much smaller number of projects committed, but among them 
It is the NEOM Green Hydrogen Projects in Saudi Arabia, which is the world's largest projects, uh, project that has already taken a, a final investment decision. If we are going to take into account also the projects that, that they are undergoing feasibility studies, or uh, they are at the very early stages of development, the pipeline of the announced projects spans to a much wider geographical coverage. Europe still accounts for around a third of the total project pipeline, but projects are also developed in various other parts of the world with good renewable resources. For example, Australia and Latin America account each for around a fifth of the electrolyzer project pipeline, and they are followed by Africa, uh, which accounts for around 10% of uh, the electrolyzer's projects. Now, I'm going to give the floor to the next speaker, my colleague, Francesco. Thank you, Sabruda. As we have just seen, electrolyzers are attracting massive interest, but they are not the only technology route to produce low emission hydrogen. The use of fossil fuels with carbon capture, utilization and storage, CCUS, can also play a significant role in scaling up the production of low emission hydrogen. Taking into account both these production routes, the annual production of low emission hydrogen could reach 38 million tons by 2030. And this is 50% larger than it was at the time when we released the Global Hydrogen Review last year. Of these 38 million tons, 27 million tons are based on electrolysis and 10 million tons are based on projects using fossil fuels with CCUS. When we look at the geographical distribution of projects, we can observe some striking differences. Electrolysis projects have a bigger geographical diversity with Europe, Australia, Latin America leading in terms of announcements. In the case of projects aiming to use fossil fuels with carbon capture utilization and storage, they are much more concentrated with North America alone accounting for half of the announcements and Europe uh, following with about 40%. In terms of maturity, we can see that a larger share of electrolysis projects are at early stages of development. But despite this, the amount of low emission hydrogen that could be produced from projects that are at least undergoing a feasibility study is 60% larger than in the case of projects based on fossil fuels with CCUS. When we look at committed projects, both technology pathways are in a similar situation. In fact, in total, projects that have at least reached the final investment decision account for only 4% of the potential production by 2030. This may look small, but in absolute term, it has doubled since last year, reaching about 2 million tons. The slow progress in project implementation is a consequence of barriers that could be expected in a sector that needs to build up complex value chains. And these are uncertainties about demand, lack of clarity in regulation and also a lack of infrastructure to deliver to the final users. And all of them have been exacerbated by inflation and by sluggish policy implementation. Focusing on the cost challenge, uh, inflation has in fact contributed to make this a barrier which is much more difficult to overcome. Uh, inflation has gripped the global economy since 2022 significantly increasing the prices of both equipment and also the interest rates on loans. This had an impact on the economics of hydrogen projects, with some projects that um, conducted feasibility studies before mid-2022 that had to rework their cost estimates and reevaluate their financial plans in order to accommodate for such cost increases. And in some cases, this was up to 50% in terms of cost increase, with several factors uh, at play here. The first one is that the installed cost of electrolyzer has increased significantly in the past few years due to increase in both materials but also in labor cost. The capital cost, the capex for an installed electrolyzer, range between $1,700 per kilowatt and $2,000 per kilowatt, with a year on year increase estimated at about 9% compared to the capital cost observed in 2021. Second, the cost inflation had an impact on renewable electricity projects, which is the main electricity source for most electrolyzer projects. These two combined, so the higher electrolyzer capex and the renewable electricity cost increase, 
lead to a cost increase of about 20% for a renewable hydrogen project. However, the largest cost increases come from the rise in the cost of capital. Renewable hydrogen projects are in fact capital intensive projects. Therefore, they are very sensitive to changes in financing cost. A three percentage point increase in the cost of capital raises today's levelized cost of hydrogen production by nearly one third. Cost inflation increases the gap between the available public support and the production cost. And as a consequence, public funds cannot be shared across as many projects because financing needs for individual projects become larger. However, with cost rising more slowly now, the main impact may be delays to reaching the final investment decisions rather than cancellations of the projects. And with that, I hand over to my colleague, Cristo. Thank you, Francesco. Um, on this slide, uh, you can see a global map on, of the anticipated production cost for low emission hydrogen in 2030, based on solar and wind power or a combination thereof. And first we can state that low emission hydrogen can be produced economically on all inhabited continents. However, the achievable minimum production cost and especially the production volumes at low cost do differ. We do not see a global average for either solar or wind power when it comes to the hydrogen production cost. Um, given the right region and the right technology, both technologies can produce equally cheap hydrogen. In some region, it might be advisable to combine wind and solar power to hybrid power plants. Um, in these cases, the increased load factor of the electrolysis offsets the uh, need for higher investments. Um, this is very project specific though, and also depends strongly on the cost of capital. On the expenditure side, we of course expect um, decrease in costs due to um, the economy of scale and the maturity of the technologies, but we also see regional differences. One example here might be China or the Indian subcontinent, where a favorable combination of low investment cost with um, uh, abundant renewable resources leads to very low hydrogen production cost. Globally, we expect low emission hydrogen production cost based on solar and wind to drop down to as low as 1.5 US dollar per kilogram of hydrogen by the year 2030. The next slide focuses on trade of low emission hydrogen. Um, and we have brought you two figures based on our newly released or updated um, hydrogen projects database. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the exporters the projects have been chosen only with a specific export element and the countries have been aggregated to uh, continents. Uh, and we see that Australia is leading the pack here with 50% of the announced trade volume in hydrogen in the year 2030. On the importing side, Europe is the biggest player with nearly five megatons of imports from all continents. However, more than half of the projects have not defined any target country yet. And this pattern becomes even more obvious when we have a look at the specific off-takers for the projects um, shown here on the very right-hand side. Um, more than two thirds of the projects did not disclose or find an off-taker yet, which again underlines the discrepancy between the supply and the demand side that has been highlighted by my colleagues before. Looking at the form in which hydrogen will be traded, um, we can see that ammonia um, is responsible for the vast majority of um, shipped hydrogen. Um, the amount of ammonia traded by the year 2030, uh, according to our project pipeline, accounts for three times the amount of ammonia that is being traded today. And this focus on, on, on ammonia is um, down to two reasons. The first uh, would be that ammonia has a certain demand today already, which makes it easier to find off takers. And on the other hand, um, the existing trade of ammonia means that uh, port infrastructures and vessel fleets are already in place. However, we also see some projects aiming at the export of liquefied or compressed hydrogen and also synthetic hydrocarbons. Overall, the current pipeline uh, suggests a global trade of low emission hydrogen um, by the year 2030 of up to 16 megatons, uh, which is an increase of more than 25% compared to our last assessment. But still the progress of the existing projects is rather slow with only three projects having reached final um, investment decision stage. So there is still a noteworthy uncertainty. And with that, I hand over to my colleague Megumi. Thank you, Christoph. 
For hydrogen to become a tradable commodity, there is a need for harmonized certification, regulation, and standards. IPHE has finalized a methodology for determining the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production, conversion, and transport of hydrogen as a first step towards the development of an international standard by the ISO. In terms of certifications, there are currently only voluntary guarantee of origin certification schemes that are operational in Australia, Denmark, Italy, Netherlands, and Spain. <coughs> These guarantee of origin generally label hydrogen produced from renewable sources or renewable electricity. The European Union and the U United Kingdom have already established a regulatory framework on the carbon threshold on hydrogen. France, India, Japan, and Korea are developing similar legal frameworks to differentiate hydrogen production by emission intensities. France defines hydrogen as low carbon for hydrogen with emission intensities under 3.38 CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen, which is more stringent than that of the EU, which is 3.4 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen. Japan's threshold is the same as the EU. India will differentiate hydrogen at 2 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen. As hydrogen markets have begun to reach a certain level of maturity, Canada and the United States have adopted a progressive scale that would still support the much needed hydrogen technologies and infrastructure with a gradual transition towards less emission intensive modes of production. In Canada, the Clean Hydrogen Investment Tax Credit will cover 15 to 40% of eligible project costs with higher funding for low carbon hydrogen. In the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act included tax credits for clean energy technologies, including hydrogen production. Renewable-based hydrogen would enjoy double benefits from the Clean Hydrogen Production Tax Credit 45V, along with relevant tax intensive incentives. Low carbon hydrogen will still gain advantage from either the 45V or the CCUS 45Q. The divergence in scope of the supply chain cons uh, considered for accounting emissions, the threshold for low carbon and renewable hydrogen, together with the eligibility criteria, pose additional transaction costs for project developers. The need for mutual recognition of certification schemes was acknowledged in the G7 and G20 this year. Employing emission intensity for, for hydrogen production based on an agreed methodology could enable certain interoperability and minimize market fragmentation. Now I will hand the floor to our colleague Amalia. So we have been discussing about production, about trade, and now I would like to share with you some insights about the transport infrastructure that will enable that this production actually reach the demand and also about the storage infrastructure that will make sure that even in the event of supply disruptions, we can guarantee hydrogen supply and also that will allow us to handle <laughs> fluctuations from renewable energy. So based on the announced projects on hydrogen transmission pipelines, we could actually have around 30,000 kilometers pipeline already by 2030. And this will actually be in line with the needs of the IA's net zero emissions scenario. Uh, most of these projects have been announced in Europe, but we have also seen relevant announcements in other countries such as China and Oman. And despite the fact that today we don't have any offshore hydrogen pipeline, we actually see some announcements that are looking into offshore hydrogen pipelines, especially around the North Sea, in the Baltic Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, and even potentially connecting North Africa with Europe. By 2050, uh, the amount of hydrogen transmission pipeline that will be needed could reach up to 200,000 kilometers. And this is equivalent approximately to 20% of the pipeline transmission length of natural gas today. So despite uh, the good news of these annou announcements, only uh, 100 uh, kilometers of pipelines have reached a final investment decision. 
This lack of final investment decision might be due to different reasons, such as uncertainty in production, uncertainty in demand, a limited regulatory framework regarding hydrogen transmission that is being developed by some countries, but also by the fact that hydrogen pipelines and in general gas pipelines have very significant economy of scales. They usually have capacity of around a few gigawatts. Nevertheless, as a good signal, uh, since the publication of the last Global Hydrogen Review, we have seen that countries have performed several call of interest, for example, Belgium, France, <coughs> Hungary, and one ongoing in Spain, that are trying to first assess in a non-binding phase what's the interest for hydrogen transmission infrastructure to perform feasibility studies. And if successful, this will be potentially followed by a binding phase to contract transmission capacities that will lead to final investment decisions. Regarding hydrogen underground storage infrastructure, even if the red dot seems that there has been no announcement, there has been some announcements. By 2030, we could actually have around five terawatt hours of storage, and this will increase to 30 terawatt hours of storage by 2050. But this falls well behind. Uh, what is required or what will be required in a net zero emissions scenario. And to put it into perspective, the current amount of uh, underground um, natural gas storage is 5,000 terawatt hours. So we are talking about very tiny amounts. The technologies that have been announced to provide this uh, underground storage uh, capacity will mostly be in the short term salt carbons due to their flexibility. And in the longer term, we also see investments in depleted gas fields, which can play a very important role to guarantee security of supply. Nevertheless, the technology is still not proof at a scale. It has a low to a level, so it should first be proof at a scale in order to be realized. Um, we have seen some projects for underground hydrogen storage. None of them have reached a final investment decision. Nevertheless, as with the case of hydrogen transmission pipelines during 2023, we have seen three calls of interest in France and the Netherlands uh, to confirm the interest and to conduct some studies to assess the sizing of potential facilities. We should highlight that despite these announcements, any um, infrastructure projects, any gas infrastructure projects have lonely times. So actually, if uh, we don't have accelerated action and early planning, we actually risk not to be on track for a net zero emissions scenario. So this increase in low emission hydrogen production will actually require an increase on the amount of capital flowing to realizing these projects. In 2022, the amount of spending in low emission production projects and related infrastructure for conversion was 1 billion US dollar. But in 2030, just eight years later, uh, in the net zero emissions scenario, this investment should be 120 billion US dollar just for the production and conversion of low emission hydrogen. This is a huge growth that actually implies a 70% annual growth in annual spending. My colleagues share with you uh, what are the announced projects on electrolytic hydrogen amounting to around 28 million tons of hydrogen by 2030. Of this amount, around 20 million 10 million tons of hydrogen is planned in emerging economies. This is around a third of the projects are planned in emerging economies. So this means the significant amounts of capital should, should go to emerging economies in order to realize these projects. But emerging economies have traditionally projects, uh, <coughs> problems in attracting finance. But already since 2022, we have seen several international finance activities that are trying to address this gap. More specifically, no. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, more specifically, we see that uh, from 2022, for the first time, uh, so there were some uh, multilateral uh, fin uh, finance uh, 
towards um, hydrogen production projects in emerging economies. Uh, we should highlight the, the finance provided by the World Bank, by the European Investment Bank, namely to countries such as India, Chile, and Brazil. Um, and this uh, money actually, just during the first half of 2023, growth fourfold compared to the previous year, reaching almost 5 billion US dollar. This money has mostly been made available to countries as loans for governments that they can spend to conduct feasibility studies to support capacity building or for project development. We see that uh, less than 1% of this money has been available to countries as technical assistance grants or directly project equity. And we have also seen some bilateral finance initiatives. Uh, one of the largest one is from the German Development Bank that, for example, is creating a credit fund uh, of 100 million US dollar for Chile. So we have seen the present uh, financing needs, especially from emerging economies, but we have more needs in order to realize the low emission hydrogen potential. And these are pressing innovation needs. The degree of technology maturity varies widely uh, between the, the different value chains of hydrogen. So for example, for hydrogen production technologies, uh, they have relatively high uh, technology maturity levels and they are commercially available and we are still having major innovation breakthroughs that are trying to look at decreasing costs, improving efficiencies or reducing the reliance of critical uh, materials such as, for example, iridium. But we can say the same for end-use technologies, especially for end-use technologies that are planning to use hydrogen and where there are very limited alternatives to achieve decarbonization. So they actually have very low TRL levels. If we use patents uh, as a proxy for innovation, more specifically international patent family that are patents that have been filled in at least two uh, of patent office. We can see that uh, global uh, hydrogen patenting is increasing and we have similar levels for production and in use. Nevertheless, as I mentioned before, their material levels is very different. So actually for production technologies, uh, most of this patent growth is driven <coughs> by electrolysis. Electrolysis technologies account for around 70% of the patents in hydrogen production technologies. But for end use, um, uh, around 60% of the patents are due to the automotive sector, which is growing very rapidly. Nevertheless, the patenting in key sectors where we have limited alternatives is still very low, such as aviation, shipping, or steel. So while we could think that uh, using patents as a proxy for innovation, um, we the innovation is having a fast pace. Uh, this is mostly due to the fact of innovation in electrolysis and automotive sector, and innovation is remarkably low in key and use technologies. And now my colleague Jose will continue providing additional insights. Thank you very much, Amalia. Um, continuing on this uh, last point about uh, end uses, I will speak about uh, demand creation, which has been one of the special focus of the of the report this year. As we have mentioned earlier in the presentation, based on announced projects, low emission hydrogen production could reach 38 million tons by 2030, which is quite in line with the sum of all the targets for low emission hydrogen production that governments around the world have been adopting in the last few years, as you can see in the slide, which account for up to 35 million tons. Now the question is, who is going to absorb all this supply of low emission hydrogen? Without robust demand, the producers for low emission hydrogen will not be able to secure off takers and then will not be able to underpin the large scale investments that they need to make their projects a reality, which jeopardizes uh, the viability of the entire low emission hydrogen industry. We have assessed the demand that could be created by meeting government plans, and we have realized that this is not sufficient to match their ambitions on the low emission hydrogen production side. Around 7 million tons of hydrogen demand could be created by 2030 with the policies that have been already implemented or enforced in the different countries. 
uh, this could grow up to 14 million tons of uh, demand if uh, uh, government targets are met, but the vast majority of these targets still are not backed up by uh, concrete policies. And in addition, only half of this demand is focused on existing hydrogen uses, such as refining or, chemi or the chemical industry, which are a better place to adopt low emission hydrogen in the near term. Governments have been cooperating uh, with the private sector, uh, launching several international cooperation initiatives with the objective of accelerating the deployment of clean energy technologies in recent years. And some of these initiatives have a significant activity on hydrogen. These initiatives can help in aggregating demand for low emission hydrogen, but based on their current commitments, we think that they could create just between one and three million tons of low emission hydrogen demand by 2030. Moreover, the real impact of these pledges still remains to be seen, and uh, the demand signals are quite unclear, as you can see by this uh, range between one and three million tons of potential demand. An important observation is that none of this initiative is focused on, um, on existing hydrogen uses and the vast majority of them target new applications for hydrogen. The private sector has already taken the first steps in the adoption of low emission hydrogen through offtake agreements. Although the activities are still at very small scale, they could reach just around 2 million tons by, of low emission hydrogen by 2030, or this is what has been signed by the, by the moment that we published the report at the end of September. And actually, more than half of these agreements are just preliminary with non-binding conditions between the, the two actors. Um, on this topic of demand creation, we would like to put the spotlight or the spotlight on the critical role that existing hydrogen uses can play in scaling up low emission hydrogen use. Switching to low emission hydrogen in existing applications, such as refining on the chemical sector, presents a much lower technology risk compared to new applications in heavy industry, in transport, or in power generation. This can be observed when we take a look to the production projects that have at least taken a final investment decision, more than half of which are linked to existing hydrogen uses, particularly ammonia production. The adoption of quotas or mandates for low emission hydrogen use in refining, in ammonia production and in methanol production can unlock large amounts of demand and create the required economies of scale that can bring down the cost for low emission hydrogen production and then help the, the industry to reach cost parity with non-low emission of, uh, production options. However, we cannot forget about these new applications, particularly those that we think that will be critical for a net zero future, such as steel production, aviation, or shipping. Adoption in existing applications should be the first priority, but getting on track with our climate ambitions require additional action on these new applications. In this case, demand pool policies, like the quotas or uh, mandates that I have just mentioned, should be complemented with innovation and demonstration efforts, since, as my colleague Amalia has just explained, in many cases, the technologies that, that are needed to use hydrogen in these applications are still under development. And with that, I hand over to Uber for finishing the presentation. Thank you very much, um, Yossi. Um, let me just finish by providing um, a brief explanation of some of the key recommendations that we um, published this year in the report. Um, so to start with, uh, we've, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen that several uh, support schemes uh, for funding. Uh, first, uh, large-scale projects have been announced, um, but uh, many of these support schemes have not been implemented or the funding has not been made available, which is um, hindering investment decisions. Um, when we look at um, demand, government um, must take the lead and implement um, policies to stimulate action in the private sector, combining um, support schemes, incentives, but also regulations like quota mandates um, that require the use of hydrogen existing applications like the refining sector uh, or the chemical sector. Um, the private sector can also contribute by establishing um, international cooperation initiatives, uh, which are particularly focusing on um, aggregating demand in these existing applications that I just mentioned. 
Um, third point I would like to highlight is that um, governments should move, uh, continue moving forward with the implementation of regulation and certification schemes based on the environmental attributes of hydrogen. Governments um, should also work together to um, um, ensure um, mutual recognition of certificates, which um, could to a certain level also then enable um, interoperability of different um, certification schemes. And referring to the um, referring to the emission intensity in this regulation, certification systems um, is a kind of key enabler or facilitates the, um, the opportunities for mutual recognitions between different systems. Um, when it comes to licensing and permitting of um, hydrogen projects, governments should um, work to um, make these processes as efficient as possible also encourage coordination between different stakeholders to minimize the project lead times, uh, which can be quite long, particularly if you think about or look at hydrogen infrastructure per projects like pipelines or, um, or terminals. And um, the last point I would to mention is that government can also can take action to, um, to support project developers that are currently struggling under the impact of the inflation, meaning increasing equipment costs, also increasing cost of capital, financing costs. So governments can provide for, or can support developers, for example, through loan guarantees, also public equity investments in projects. Um, so with that said, um, I would just like to highlight, as already mentioned at the beginning by my um, colleague Timo Gull, um, that we've released today, um, two hydrogen products databases. The first one is our hydrogen production products database, which tracks low emission project, low emission hydrogen production projects. Um, and uh, we started this database actually in 2019, and the database now comprises almost 2000 uh, projects, which are differentiated by country, by technology, by project status. And in addition, we released also today the first time um, a hydrogen infrastructure database, which provides information on infrastructure projects like pipelines, blending hydrogen into existing gas pipelines, also information on import and export um, terminals. Um, so that's kind of second uh, database that we've released today. And in around two weeks time, we will also provide um, on our website two new interactive tools, which allow to explore some of the data that we've presented you um, today. So there's one tool, particularly looking at the hydrogen products database, where one can, on a global map, particular look into individual projects. And the second tool, which is focusing on the hydrogen production costs from renewables, uh, which also allow to, um, to vary some of the key um, input parameters for low emission hydrogen production or renewable hydrogen production costs like technology costs, also the cost of capital. Um, with that said, I will um, reach the end of the presentation. We will just um, uh, break for two minutes just to collect some of the questions that you've raised um, in the Q&A function. Mm -hmm. And we'll get back to you with then with the um, discussion on these questions. Thank you very much.
<coughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, we will start. Uh, I mean, you can keep us, uh, adding questions. We will try to address as many as many as possible. Um, we would like to start with a couple of questions about the demand creation, uh, mentioning which is the the largest reason for the lack, lack of demand for hydrogen and and the uh, policies that or how this can be stimulated. Um, something that we would, would like to clarify at the beginning is that there is not lack of demand for hydrogen. We already have 95 million tons of hydrogen demand every year. Um, the, the, where we see lack of uh, demand creation is of low emission hydrogen. And here we have to differentiate in two options. First of all, is low emission hydrogen to replace existing uh, hydrogen demand? And second of all, is low emission hydrogen to be used in new applications? In the case of low emission hydrogen to replace existing demand, the main barrier is the cost differential. So today we need policies that can help um, uh, users of hydrogen um, to to uh, uh, access to that hydrogen at a lower cost. So either providing subsidies on the demand on the production side or in demand side policies like contracts for difference, um, uh, carbon pricing for increase the cost of, of uh, non low emission hydrogen. And then in the case of new applications, in addition of the cost differential with the um, the, the technologies or the or the incumbent fossil fuels. In addition to that, there's also a technology barrier. So as my colleague Amalia mentioned, the, the technologies are still not uh, completely developed or not commercially developed for the, their application. Um, then uh, the, the next uh, question, which uh, we have not addressed yet in the presentation is about um, the low, low uh, sorry, the potential for white hydrogen, uh, potential in your outlook, and whether it's still considered an academic research subject at this stage. So over, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we um, actually included a short section on, on white hydrogen um, or natural hydrogen in um, this year's um, GHR. And um, I mean, it looks, of course, if one looks at the status today of um, natural hydrogen, um, I would say it's still at a kind of at an exploration uh, phase, um, trying to understand what are the resources in different parts. I mean, just this year or earlier this year in France and uh, Lorraine, um, also some natural hydrogen was discovered. Uh, some of the cost estimates uh, by experts are quite uh, quite encouraging. I mean, production costs um, in the range of one dollar per kilogram of hydrogen or even lower. But of course, one also has to be careful that we've not seen any practical production yet, not yet any pilot project uh, really um, extracting this natural hydrogen. Um, so for that reason, um, we are a bit um, cautious in terms of relying, I'd say, in our current assessments or scenarios on natural hydrogen. But of course, it's, um, it's an important area to continue looking into. And um, with technology innovation, also with developing technologies to extract natural hydrogen, of course, the situation can change in the future. Thank you, Ben, uh, for taking one of the questions about um, um, infrastructure. Do you have a view on hydrogen blading is to existing systems, Amalia? So actually, as part of the hydrogen infrastructure database that we are releasing, we are also keeping track of the blending projects. But we need to say that our view is that it has a very limited role. And so far, uh, we have tracked almost 40 uh, blending projects in, in the distribution grids. And these are really very small projects that could be considered to be at the demonstration phase. It could have potentially a larger role in some distribution grids, which are currently using tone gas, such as, for example, in Singapore, Hong Kong, or Hawaii. There, low emission hydrogen can play a role, but in other parts, it's very, very limited. Thanks, Amalia. Um, some other questions that we are seeing. Um, let me just, uh, those that have not been answered yet. So which role uh, IA projects for the production of low emission hydrogen from waste uh, biomass? Uh, maybe where you can take this one as well. Biomass. Um. Yeah, I mean, we see some projects also being developed um, to use or produce um, hydrogen from from biomass, also from um, from waste through gasification. 
Um, there's, of course, we also see in Brazil recently also um, um, suggestions or approaches to produce hydrogen from bioethanol. So um, there we see some development being being explored to use um, to produce hydrogen from biomass. Uh, it, of course, depends on the availability of, of biomass and also um, the cost of biomass and alternative uses for biomass. So it's, of course, a question similar to hydrogen biomass is quite a versatile energy carrier so it can be used in different parts of the energy system so the question is whether it should be used for for hydrogen production whether it should be used for liquid biofuel production whether it should be directly being co-fired -fire, um, in for example in the power sector to provide flexibility to the electricity system and i guess the the choice or the use of biomass very much depends on the local circumstances what are the alternative opportunities in these different um, sectors or areas to, to decarbonize to which extent one um, could use biomass and for hydrogen production. So it's, um, um, I don't have a very clear answer. I guess it really, very, as I said, it very much depends on the on the local circumstances uh, where it can uh, be an interesting option to, uh, to pursue. Thank you, Ben. Um, we have a question about how to mitigate future increases in the cost of capital for hydrogen production, for example, government funding, green, fund, green bonds, CFDs, Megumi. Thank you for the question. The cost of capital for hydrogen production uh, can be decreased uh, largely through government funding. Uh, there are uh, most of the projects and uh, uh, are largely initially funded by through government programs um the what else um the inflation may increase the the cost of capital so um to uh, secure the hydrogen production supply chain by manufacturing domestically could potentially um be a secure way, uh, provide a secure way to keep the initial costs, as well as multilateral uh, international banks have started to fund uh, hydrogen projects in developing uh, economies as well. So that is another method that is being employed today. Thanks, Megumi. Um, just uh, well, a quick clarification from one of the questions. So the data explorer should be available in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's the target, but they will be announced on the IA webpage, same as our social networks. And um, uh, maybe a last question, because we only have a couple of minutes in developing countries. Do you think that it is better to start with domestic market on, and then develop export market, or on the contrary, start with exports to lower prices and encourage the growth of the domestic markets? Amalia, please. So I want to share with you that actually uh, next week uh, the IA will release a special report, a special edition of the World Energy Outlook, especially looking into Latin America, where we will discuss the potential role that low emission hydrogen could play in the Latin American and the Caribbean region. I, have, I can share with you some insights that will be available in this report, and actually is we need both to go hand by hand. First of all, and the priority should be that low emission hydrogen especially is used to satisfy the domestic demand. And it should be considered that, for example, in the case of Latin America, they are importing billions of US dollars per year on ammonia and on urea. And this is creating a lot of market volatility and energy insecurity issues. So low emission hydrogen have a very important role to play in the economy. But at the same time, low emission hydrogen offers a huge range of possibilities to export, but also to export not only as low emission hydrogen, but to create uh, added value, exporting fertilizers, exporting, for example, low emission steel. And we think that emerging economies should explore both options, but without forgetting that low emission hydrogen also has a role to play in increasing energy security in their countries. 
Thank you very much, Amalia. And with that, uh, we finish the Q&A session. I hand over to before finishing the... the uh, just one final uh, qualification. You can always reach us if you have no questions, no answer, or more doubts about the report at the email address hydrogen <laughs> at IEA.org. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much, you see. And also, of course, thank you very much um, for, for joining our webinar today. Um, yeah, as you see, just said, uh, more information is available on our website when it comes to the report. But of course, also I mentioned the the um, hydrogen product databases, also the new tools being available in two weeks' time. So, um, um, yeah, this concludes the webinar. As I said, I just would like to thank you for joining us um, today and wish you a very nice um, rest of the day wherever you are. Thank you very much. <laughs>